as well. So, and you might notice that some of the names in there are people you know. Some of the authors of those little devotionals are, are might, they just might be people you know. So that's really good. This morning we're going to be in Galatians 5 today. This is one of those instructory sermons. Normally I like to bring you a didactic kind of a sermon. That's a teaching. That's where we, we look at doctrine. You know, this is a teaching that the Bible offers, and I want to break down what's being taught, and I want to help us all apply it to our lives so that it makes sense, and maybe be encouraging, and maybe be challenging, and maybe be life-changing. This section of Scripture that we're in is is an instructionary section. If you've been following along with us on Wednesday, you know in Galatians 5, we break into a new section of Galatians that is uh, more practical. Paul's been talking to us now for the last four chapters, uh, explaining his position, explaining the doctrinal position, and now he's talking about what we should do, about what he's been talking to us for these last four chapters. And that's this particular section, and I always come to these with uh, a special level of caution because I don't want you to think that I have it all figured out, and that what I'm telling you is, I figured out the answer, and so just do what I say and you'll be fine. I want you to know that when I come to these instructionary sections, I always find them to be particularly challenging to me. And so what you get is what has challenged me in this section. When I read this and and I say, well, this is how a person ought to live and this is what a person ought to do, I'm, I'm telling you this is how I ought to live and this is what I ought to do. And in some of those things, maybe I'm, I'm figuring it out. And in some of those things, maybe I got a long way to go. So let's look today at Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16 of Galatians 5. Very famous and well-loved passage here. You'll find that you probably have at least some of this, if not all of it, memorized. Galatians 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, well, you're not under the law. Now, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discourse, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's stop there. We'll pray and take a look at that. Lord, I thank you for leading us to this section. I pray that we will be challenged. I pray that you will lead us and guide us. I pray that you'll help us to know exactly what we need to know so that we might be people who are free to live with and for you. Help us to hear your voice, we pray. Amen. In this section, you will find the three easy steps to living the Christian life. Three easy steps to victory. I hate it when somebody tells me it's just a few easy steps. The other day, Wendy and, and Addie were talking about some new thing that they're going to make in the kitchen. I don't even know. And Addie says, oh, it's so easy. You just start by making a simple syrup. What? Simple syrup to me is when I go to the aisle and I find the log cabin and pull it off the shelf. I mean, I have no idea what she's even talking about. But oh, she says, it's so easy. Maybe for her, but not for me. I, you know, I come from a, a business background, and one of the things that you have to do in the business background is, is, is plan. Strategic planning is one of the biggest things in the world of business. And, and as I've gone over various different aspects of strategic planning, I actually found five easy steps for strategic planning produced by the Price CPA Group, who you've probably heard of. They're a major deal in the business world. They say, you know, all organizations must strategically plan. This is something that we do in our, in our leadership team meetings on a regular basis, 
we lay out strategy and we find ways to accomplish the things we feel like God is calling us to accomplish. These guys say it's really easy to strategic plan. And since I have invested hours, years of my life to developing strategic, strategic plan, I was encouraged to see how easy it can be. So let me share with you the easy steps. Step number one, articulate your mission, vision, and goals. Mission, that's what you see the organization doing while it exists. Vision, what it should look like if we're doing that. And goals, how we get to those spots. Articulate them. Many business leaders find it helpful, if not necessary, to use an independent consultant to help with the process. It creates consistency, accountability, and focus. Otherwise, the requirements of daily business operations can get the process off track. So hire somebody to help with that. That's easy. Step two, get the information you need from the right sources. You may want input from clients, employees, market research, internal reports, and even those who provide professional services to your company. Ask everybody and pay them for the answers. That's easy step number two. It's pretty easy. Step number three, this has got to be the easiest one of all. Determine trends and define strategies for the next three to five years with confidence. Yeah, just do that with your grocery list at home. Determine trends and define strategies for the next three to five years with confidence. Yeah, and then they go on about how you should break strategies down by department, and you should break strategies down by communication, and you should have a clear assignment of accountability for action with schedules for accomplishment. More than five real goals in each area might be unrealistic. That's pretty easy. Now, step four, implement the strategies. The more clear the accountability of accomplishment and timeline expectations are, the more effectively the plan will be executed. The results can be transformational if overall goals and department goals are aligned and resources, funds, personnel, equipment, and training are provided to support the accomplishment on the agreed upon schedule. That sounds pretty easy. And then step five, evaluate and redefine the plan regularly. They say quarterly quarterly reviews of everything you've just done, review it quarterly, and decide whether you should keep going that way or you should make minor adjustments. That sounds pretty easy. No. That is a life's work for a CEO of a company right there. I mean, that's what large boards get together and work on day after day after day for years. Five easy steps. Strategic planning. It's not easy. It's not, when somebody says, hey, this is easy, you know it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. When somebody says, it's new from Ronco, set it and forget it, you know it's not going to work. And so when I present to you the three easy steps that Paul gives us today, I want you to understand they're life-changing, they're transformational, and they require everything you are and everything you've got. Remember who Paul's talking to. He's talking to churches in Galatia. They are Gentiles like us, not, not uh, religious Jewish people. They are people who had lived entrapped to the world. They had been trying to find ways to satisfy themselves, to meet their own needs, to satisfy the desires of their hearts, and they were finding that impossible. As they struggled through life with their pagan religion and the culture surrounding them, they just couldn't get out of the trap of getting up every day and going to work and coming home and paying the bills and doing the dishes and hoping it's good enough and doing it again tomorrow, just like us. And then Paul came along and said, there is a whole different kind of life. You can be free from that cycle and that trap. You can live in the freedom of knowing Christ your Savior who set you free and gives you purpose for everything you do in life. You can have purpose and meaning and fulfillment simply by knowing Him and holding His hand and that's all. And they said, that's great, I want that. Just like us. And then so Paul came and he told them these things and they said to Paul, now that we are getting to know Christ, what should we do? What actions or activities should we be involved in to know Christ? Paul might have given them some answers. I don't know. He might have told them, read your Bible and pray every day. That's what Tozer always says. Maybe that. All we know is that once Paul left, they were still looking for, what do I do? What actions and activities can I take part in that will help me be successful in the Christian life? Because you see, just because they knew Christ... 
Just because they'd called on him and prayed on him for salvation and gathered together with the church every Sunday and worshipped his name and knew they were going to heaven, they were still struggling with the world. Maybe not as bad as before, maybe worse than before, but they were still struggling with getting up every day and going to work, and now they felt like they had to find some way to, to be more righteous in the midst of it. A group of people came along and said, yes, as a matter of fact, there are things you must do, and they gave them a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts. Do dress this way, don't dress that way. Do eat this way, don't eat that way. Do go follow through with this ritual, don't go follow through with that ritual. And then you will be living a righteous Christian life based on what you do. Now come on, that's just like us. We're just in the exact same spot. We have come to Christ hoping for that freedom and fulfillment. We know that there's freedom and fulfillment in Christ. We want to be free from the things of the world. So we say, what do we do? And we find others who will tell us, or we invent for ourselves lists of rules and regulations. If we just live this way, we will have freedom from the things of the world. The problem is, not only when we do that, not only do we not have freedom from the things of the world, we've added a whole new layer of things to be enslaved to. Now we're getting up Monday morning trying to make it count. Oh, and I also have to do all these other things I've decided I must do to live as a child of God. And what we end up finding out is we're miserable. At least the people in the world, they might be dying and going to hell. They might not have any hope. At the end of the day, they might lie in their bed full of regrets about all the horrible things they did today, but at least they had fun doing them. We lie in bed saying, oh, I... I could have lived like a Christian today, but I didn't. Now what am I supposed to do? And so then we buy books. Three easy steps to spiritual victory. And we read these books, and we read how it worked for the guy who wrote the book, but it ain't working for me. Four easy steps to overcoming in the Spirit. And it doesn't work for us. Because quite frankly, it's not easy. This thing that he has called us to is not easy. It's simple. It's simple, but it's not easy. Paul has included here in Galatians chapter 5, three steps. That if we will follow, this is his practical application of everything he told us in Galatians 1 through 4. Honestly, as I read through it, it's his practical application of the entire book of Romans. If we will follow these steps, we will find freedom and fulfillment in Christ, but that doesn't mean it's easy. Step 1 Walk by the Spirit. And you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. See, here's the deal. First of all, when Paul refers to flesh, he's talking about the carnal nature, the person that we once were. He refers to that as the old man, the old man inside of me, the one that is selfish and simply wants to satisfy me, the one that is in active rebellion against Christ and antagonistic to anyone who gets in my way. That's what he's referring to as the flesh. He says, walk by the Spirit. You'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. The flesh wants to be satisfied. The flesh cries out to be satisfied. And so we set together a list of rules of the things that we'll allow the flesh to do and not allow the flesh to do. And a battle starts up inside of us to try to do the good things and to try not to do the bad things. Paul said, don't do that anymore. Don't try to do the good things and don't try not to do the bad things. Don't live, he calls it, under the law. Don't try to do the good things and try not to do the bad things. Instead, leave all those things behind and just walk with the Spirit. Go AWOL on that war. Just walk away with the Spirit of God. Quit trying to do the good things. Quit trying not to do the bad things. This is often what we refer to as the pink elephant paradox. Have you heard about this? A number of years ago, a lot of years ago, a, a psychologist took a bunch of volunteers and said, I'm working on understanding how the brain works. And so I'm going to sit you down and I'm going to ask you each in private a list of about 50 questions and I want you to answer with the very first thing that comes to mind, the very first thing you picture in your mind, that's how I want you to answer each question that I ask. And they said, okay, no problem. And then the psychologist said, but whatever you do, whatever you picture in your mind, whatever you think of, don't think about a pink elephant. Now, come on, nobody had been thinking of a pink elephant before. But the minute he said that, the only thing they could think about was a pink elephant. 
And somehow, an inordinate amount of answers to the questions he asked, the answer was, well, I picture a pink elephant. And no matter how hard they tried not to think about a pink elephant, that's the only thing they could picture. The pink elephant paradox. When we focus on not doing something, that's the thing we do. Wendy showed me a picture from Skagit Breaking, the online news source, yesterday or the day before. Somebody had, had been driving down a road and had driven right into one of those radar speed signs. This is your speed, you know. You drive through the neighborhood and you look up and it tells you how fast you're going. You know, those are designed to get your attention. They're designed to help you pay attention, right? Well, apparently they were paying so much attention to that thing, looking right at it, that they just drove right into it. Peak elephant paradox. The thing I'm thinking about, whether it's something I'm thinking about trying to do or something I'm thinking about trying not to do, that's the thing I'm going to do. This is what Paul writes about in Romans 7. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave under sin. I don't understand what I'm doing because I don't practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. No, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. Yeah, I should be doing other things. So now I'm no longer the one doing it, but it's sin living in me. It's that old man inside. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh, in that carnal nature. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil I don't want to do. Now if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not the one who does it, but it's sin living in me. Can you relate to this? Can you relate to this trap? Paul says, so I discover this law. This is the rule. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. That's how it works. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, so I want to do it his way. I want to follow his law, his set of rules. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to a law of sin in the parts of my body. I am trapped in this law of sin. I want to be trapped in God's good law. Instead, I'm trapped in the law of sin. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? It's rotting me from the outside in, trying to live under the good law of God, when instead, I'm stuck in the bad law of the flesh. He answers his own question, who will rescue me? Huh, thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, here's the problem. With my mind, I'm serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. So in my mind, I'm trying to do all of the good things. But actually what's happening as a result of the fact that I'm a fleshly person is I'm doing the bad things. But as a result of all this, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. They're not in the law. They're in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul says, I was a miserable guy. I wanted to do the good things I know I should be doing, but instead I just kept doing the bad things I shouldn't be doing. And so I developed for myself a law of all the good things I shouldn't be doing to offset the law of all the bad things I'm not supposed to be doing. And I tried to live in the law of all the good things I should be doing, but found myself continuously under the law of all the bad things I'm not supposed to be doing. How in the world am I going to get out of this? Jesus came along and said, how about no more law at all? How about you don't try to do the good things, and you don't try not to do the bad things, and instead just walk with me? Hmm. Paul says, you see, walk by the Spirit. And then you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Because you're not walking by the flesh. The works of the flesh are obvious. You can go and you can read the list and don't worry, we'll take a look at those on Wednesday. They're very intriguing to us. The thing I want you to see here is that they are the works of the flesh. This is what the flesh does. When we are trying to live a particular way, when we are trying to produce a particular result, whether we're trying to produce a good result or we're trying to produce a bad result, what we get is stuff that's basically on that list. Oh, you say, that's not, that's not always the truth. Some people are just good people. Some people 
work hard, and want to be good, and produce good stuff. I know some really good people, you say, who don't know Christ at all. They're producing good things. The works of the flesh are not their list works of the flesh. Guys like Benjamin Franklin, now there was a good guy. If ever there was a good guy, it was good old Benny Franklin, right? What a good guy. You know, he had a list of 12 virtues that he had dedicated his life to accomplishing. And he said, if I can accomplish these 12 virtues, I will be righteous. I will be righteous and I will be fulfilled. And he's probably right. If he had accomplished those virtues, he probably would have been righteous. And as a result, you say, he produced good things with his life because he tried to achieve this level of, 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 12, list of right, 12 list of virtues. If you go back and read what he wrote about it, he didn't accomplish a single one of them. First one on the list, temperance. Don't drink too much. Temperance. Seems like that would be pretty easy. I think I could probably accomplish that. Maybe I just won't drink at all. Pretty proud of myself for that. Just blew number 12 out of the water. Not humble anymore. Hmm. Number two is silence. I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm not going to share my opinions. I'm just going to sit and listen to other people. How many of you know Benjamin Franklin had an opinion? You sit and listen to other people long enough, you formulate opinion, then you've got to tell them. Ah, Miss number two, and I was really proud of myself, so I missed number 12 again. He never managed to accomplish it. And if you look over his life, as much as he did and as good of a man as he was, if you look over his life and you compare it to that list of works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, that's Benjamin Franklin. As good as he tried to be, he failed. The works of the flesh are obvious. You can tell when somebody is working out of their own power, out of their own mind, their own capability, their own life, because they produce stuff like what's in that first part of this reading in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and we'll talk about what the fruit of the Spirit is on Wednesday. You probably already know love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, what I want you to see is that's the fruit of of the Spirit. It's not the works of the spiritual man. Well, now that I'm a spiritual man, I'm going to do these good things. I'm going to have faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. How many of you know that doesn't work? I spent the first many years of my Christian faith doing exactly that. Well, I am a Christian man, and so I must be faithful and gentle and have self-control. So shut up, you idiot! It doesn't work. Ask Martin Luther. He wrote a lot about that. It doesn't work. If you try to produce it in your own self, well, this is how I must behave, and this is how I must not behave, the works of the flesh are obvious. But the fruit of the Spirit. We have this plum tree in our yard, and as long as it gets just a teeniest bit of sunlight, which is available in Washington, and lots of water, which is available in Washington, and the branches stay connected, I don't go cutting them off, it produces a bumper crop of plums every year. So many plums, we end up throwing them out. We give away a bunch of them to you guys. They're all over the yard. we got to come and pick them up. It just produces so many plums. And it's not even trying. It just happens. It just happens. Because it's all connected, and it's drawing nutrients from the ground, and it's using energy from the sun, and boom! It just happens. You can't even stop it. Believe me, I've tried. They just keep coming. It's the fruit of the Spirit. If we are not walking by the flesh, not trying to do the good things, not trying not to do the bad things, but instead we are simply with Christ, in Christ, hanging out with Him, connected to Him, staying connected, receiving the power that He gives, receiving the spiritual nutrients that He gives, we can't help it. It just happens. Fruit comes. It grows. Step number one, walk by the Spirit. You, won't des- you, you certainly won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Step number one. Step number two. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They've crucified the flesh, Paul tells us. I like that he tells us that they have crucified the flesh. He doesn't say they have done away with, they have exiled, they have beheaded They have crucified the flesh. And the reason I I, I like like that he says 
that they've crucified the flesh for two reasons. Reason number one, because crucifixion at this particular time in history was a type of capital punishment that was reserved for traitors, for enemies of the state. Did you know that's why Christ was given crucifixion as a death? Because he claimed to be a king. And if you claim to be a king, well, there's no king but Caesar. You're a traitor to the state. Therefore, you're crucified. That's what you do with traitors. You, cru- you make a public spectacle out of crucifying them. The worst kind of death Romans could think up. Worst thing you could be to a Roman was a traitor. You get the worst kind of death. You get crucified. Paul says your flesh is a traitor to you. You are wanting to live in Christ. Your flesh keeps coming along and messing that up and drawing you away and making you have allegiance to something else. Your flesh is a traitor to you. It must be crucified. The other reason I like that he uses the term crucified is because you can't do that to yourself. Think about it. For, get really morbid in your mind for just a moment and think about it. Any way that humans have found to kill other humans, you could pretty much do yourself. You can chop off your own head. You can stab yourself. You can make yourself bleed out. You can electrocute yourself. You can ingest poison. You can ingest poison gas. I mean, just think about it for a minute. Except crucifixion. That one you can't do to yourself. Because about the time you stretched yourself on there and used a hammer to put in one nail, uh uh-oh, you can't do that to yourself. In order to have someone crucified, they must be presented to an executioner who was a commander in the Roman army, and that commander would take care of it. If a traitor was found, he was brought to the commander, and the commander would see to it that they were crucified. That's how you get crucified. Now think about it. Paul says we are in a battle here. This is a war. There is a war between your flesh and your spirit. Your spirit wants to live for Christ. Your flesh wants to live for itself. Your flesh is sneaky and powerful and will take you down every time. Every, you are not stronger than the desires of your flesh. You can't do it. How are you going to defeat this thing? Paul says it's a battle. And in this battle, your whole role is to keep your eyes open for traitors. Your commanding officer, Christ, has told you to keep looking for traitors. Those thoughts that come that would lead you astray. Those those voices of your flesh that are trying to draw you into self-satisfaction away from Christ in some way. Those voices of your flesh that are speaking into you words of pride and self-idolatry. When you find them, when you see them, you take them to the commanding officer. Paul says in this that I have up on the board here, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. I am going through my day as a servant of Christ, as a soldier of the Lord. I see a traitor in my midst, a thought that has come into my mind that would draw me away from him. An activity that my flesh says, just engage in this. It'll make you feel good. It'll satisfy you. And I say, no. I recognize that that's a traitor. Paul says, be sober and vigilant. Keep your eyes open for these things. I recognize, oh, wait a minute. If I listen to that voice, if I follow that thought, I will be conquered. I cannot kill it on my own. It's part of me. Can't crucify myself. I can't take that down. Oh, how many of you have tried? I have tried so many times. Oh, this horrible thing in my mind. I am not going to do that. I am a Christian man and I don't do these things. And next thing you know, you're doing it. You can't do that. No, when you identify the traitor, you take the traitor to Christ, to your commanding officer and say, look what I found in my midst. Do away with it, Lord. And he will. He is faithful and just. He will do it. We take every thought captive to Christ. And how many of you know it's not once? It's not once. Well, I found the traitor and I have done away with him. There are a lot of them. And they're coming at you continuously. Paul says in Luke, Jesus said, if anyone wants to come over me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily not just one time daily i can can i add to that just a little bit how about continuously 
How about every moment of the day? It daily's not enough for me. I got to be honest with you. I don't, you know, I get up in the morning and I spend some time praying and reading the word and getting my marching instructions for the day, as it were. And and Lord, here's the things I'm struggling with. And then it's not like, well, I'm done. Ha ha ha. No, a couple minutes later, it's like, oh, I found another one, Lord. Here you go. Crucify that one. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> here's another one. Take that one. Oh, I thought I got this one. He must have gotten away. Would you get this one again? continuously. Eventually, you'll start to weed them out. Eventually, there will be less of them. Eventually, you'll work down to where it's not hundreds of them getting you continuously, but it's less and less and less. And you're able to to simply walk in the Spirit of God. And when you see them coming from a distance now, you can say, way out there, there's one coming. And he says, I got it. Walk by the Spirit. You You won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. Oh, hey, this is great. Wendy and I talked about this quite a bit. We actually thought that we were going to try to see if we could if we could find a way to duplicate this here in the church service, but logistics just wouldn't let it happen. Have you seen the unity candle at a wedding? Have you guys ever seen that happen? Love that. So what it is, is there's a big candle in the middle of the table, and then there's two just like regular candles off to the side. The two regular candles are lit. The one in the middle is not lit. At some point during the wedding ceremony, the bride and the groom will come up and they'll each take one of those regular candles and they'll light the candle in the middle with the two flames of the regular candles. And what they're saying, the symbolism here is, each flame is is their life. You know, one flame is the groom's life and the other flame is the bride's life. And so they take those two flames of life and they put them together and they make one flame out of them. And then after that, most important, as they're taking the candles away, they blow them out. And they're saying, my life is now over. Now it's our life. It's a new life. Always bothers me when I go to a wedding and see them do that and not blow out the candles. You can't do that. You can't be married and have a shared life together and still have my own life. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. You're heading for divorce. It's just the truth. Because you never became one person. The Bible says, leave, cleave, become one. In Genesis, they're going to leave their, house, their, their parents' house. They're going to cleave together. They're going to become one person. You've got to start right now saying, no more my life. No more what I want. No more satisfy me. This is about us now. It's a we thing. That's what he's talking about here. That's what he's talking about here. You've got to crucify the old life. It's gone. Paul says, reckon dead the old man. He, he no longer exists. There is no more me. Oh, I used to be way into these things, but it's not that I'm not into those things anymore. Now I'm into Jesus. It's, I used to be really into those things till I died. You know, if you're interested in motorcycling, this is a good, good time of year to buy a motorcycle. Springtime, people are just selling. I have seen a whole bunch of Honda Goldwings for sale recently. If you're interested in a Honda Goldwing from the 80s, it is time to buy one. They're getting cheaper and cheaper. You can buy a really nice low-mile Honda Goldwing cheap right now. You know why? The guy who bought it new in the 80s died fairly recently. He's not riding it anymore. He used to be really into motorcycling. And it's not like he just said, well, I'm not into motorcycling anymore. Now I'm into lying around in caskets. No. It's that he's dead. He can never go back to doing that. So his bike is for sale cheap. That's what we're talking about here. The old me, it's not, it's not that, well, I used to be really into whatever this horrible, prideful sin thing was that I used to do, but I have changed my ways, and now I'm into being a Jesus guy. Uh-uh. If you're still doing it, it's time to blow out your candle. It's not me. It's Christ. My life is hidden in Christ now. I don't have any use for the stuff of the old life because I'm dead to that. You see. Step number one, walk by the Spirit. You won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Step number two, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. So I'm walking with the Spirit. I used to walk by the flesh. Now I have changed. Now I'm walking by the Spirit. As I walk by the Spirit, I'm just doing away with the flesh. don't even need that anymore. The only option I have is to walk by the Spirit. And step three, if I live by the Spirit, let us stay in step with the Spirit. The picture 
is of a parade ground that Paul is painting. Have you seen soldiers on a parade ground? They walk exactly the same. Reminds me of that old Aerosmith song, Walk This Way. I know Lindsay likes that one. She likes hair bands. Walk This Way. The, it, it's, y- you've seen that old Bugs Bunny commercial where Bugs Bunny goes up to the butler and he says, where do I go? And the butler says, walk this way. And he walks a funny way. And so Bugs Bunny walks the exact same way. That's the idea. It's a parade ground. You walk in step. Every one of the soldiers walks exactly the same way. This is not like a high school marching band where we try to be left, right, left. They walk the exact same way. You can't hardly tell the difference between one or the other. And the way that they're walking the same way is they're listening to their commanding officer who is calling out the orders of what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. And they carry it out. And they walk in step. I wish I could say this is the first thing I thought of when I read this passage, but actually the first thing I thought of was Valley Girls. You remember Valley Girls from the 80s? Do you remember Valley Girls? I grew up during the Valley Girl period. Oh my gosh. Like, gag me with a spoon. Remember those guys? Oh, they were so gross. This was before the Starbucks movement. I mean, these were Valley Girls. All of you who don't know Valley Girls, go home, look them up on YouTube. You'll get a good laugh. The thing with Valley Girls is that they were all the same. They said they had their own little language and they all said the same things. They all looked the same with that stupid ponytail sticking out the side of their head. They all wore the same obnoxious clothing. They were all the same. And you could tell a valley girl from miles away by the way she walked and the way she carried her stuff and the way she said what she was going to say and the 80s clothes and the makeup. You could tell them. You just knew, don't talk to that person. She ain't got a brain. She's a valley girl. And it caught on. I mean, it was throughout the entire United States. It came from the L.A. Valley in California, this valley girl, and it spread across the United States. You could go to Illinois and find valley girls there hanging out at the mall, and you knew who they were. You could just tell by looking at them, and the reason was because they were all the same, and the reason they were all the same is because they were just kind of copying each other. In their life, they were walking in step with one another. They were being the same. This is what Jesus is telling us to do with the Spirit. Be the same. How did the valley girls get to the point where they were all copying one another? They spent every minute of every day together. If they weren't at school together, if they weren't hanging out at the mall together, then they were talking on the phone together. They didn't have texting back then. They actually had to talk to each other. They spent every waking minute together until they became homogeneous till they became the same Jesus said I am the vine you are the branches the one who remains in me dwells in me abides in me continuous that word is a is a is a continuous word it's it's one of those Greek words that has a moment of beginning but no end it's a perfect tense word there was a there was a point where it started but that word just goes on It is always present tense from that moment on. Jesus said, the one who abides, who dwells, who remains, who started at a particular point and is always present tense in that point, always remaining with me, in me, well, he produces much fruit. Because without me, you can't do a thing. Cut yourself off from the vine. I go out to my plum tree, lop off branches, which I do every year. Those branches don't produce any plums. But the ones who remain continuously in the tree, they don't have any choice. It just happens. Walk in step with the Spirit. Spend every day with me. Walk by the Spirit. I won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Now listen, I used to try to live under the certain set of rules. I was going to try to do these good things and I was going to try not to do these bad things and I was so focused on these things that that's all I did was the things and it's a continual battle and it's really frustrating and that's why people say being a Christian is not worth it because you can't do it. You're right, you can't do it. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't do it. You're right. So don't do that. Don't walk by the Spirit or don't walk by the flesh, I should say, trying to do a good thing and trying not to do a bad thing. Instead, walk by the Spirit. 
leave that battle behind, go hold his hand, hang out with him. But when you do that, you're going to have to do something about the flesh because it's going to continue, well, it's going to, continue to battle. It's like a, like a paralyzed man that doesn't have any real power over you, but it sure yells and screams a lot. And you have to listen to it the whole time. And eventually you'll give in. So you better just kill it. But you don't have the power to kill it. Only Christ does. So you bring it to him. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. They have identified that what my flesh wanted is not for me. That's, that's a traitor. A traitor to my spiritual health. So when I see the traitor, when I hear that pop up, I say, Christ, here it is again. It's for you. Stretch up my arms. Put in the nails. Let's do this again. They've crucified the flesh. And third, now we're just hanging out with him. How do I know what to do as a spiritual person? Is there a lead guide somewhere? Can I open this up and, and, and find a trail map to how to live as a spiritual person? Yeah, it's really easy. You just hang out with him. You spend every moment with him, and then you can't help it. It just starts to grow. You become more and more like him. Those are the three easy steps. Well, maybe not so easy. There are three steps you have to take again and again, every day, every moment of every day. Those are the steps. That's how Paul tells us to live as a Christian. And I don't know about you, but when I studied that this week, I thought, oh my goodness, have I got some work to do. And the work I have to do is in identifying, not defeating the flesh, not living right, but identifying the things of the flesh and just submitting it to Christ. Every now and then we come up with something and we see, ooh, there's a traitor over there. I should probably tell Jesus. But I kind of like that one. And I know if I tell Jesus, he's going to want to crucify it. I kind of like hanging out with that one. Nope. Can't walk in the spirit if you're hanging on to the flesh. So I don't know about you, but I got some, I got some crucifying to get done some submitting to him to get done. So making the choice that I love him more than that prideful idea or that self-satisfying concept. I love him more, and ultimately I'd rather hang around with him than hang around with myself doing that. Maybe you're in that same place. Let's stop for a moment and pray about that and, and take a moment and examine your own heart and and see if you are ready to say, you know what, I do love Jesus more than this thing that I've been involved in. I do love Jesus more than these other choices that I've made. And I want to be free from that. I'm tired of the battle and I'm tired of the fight and I want to be free from that. I just want to hang out with Christ. Well, now's your chance. Let's pray.